I'd like to offer a few remarks of um, welcome and thank you all very, very much for coming. It's um, a, the beginning of a one-year-long uh, seminar series that we're celebrating last night and actually tonight, um, of course, as well. And we are just really thrilled to have you here for Freedom of Speech, a Curriculum for Studies into Darkness. And today's seminar is dedicated to mapping the territory. Um, speaking of territory, I think it's appropriate to remember um, or remind us um, that we are here on land that was first inhabited by the Lenape Indians. I'd like to thank you again for coming, and I'd also like to acknowledge Laura Rajkovic, who is the co-curator of this seminar series. Um, let me tell you a few um, ideas or um, thoughts about the genesis of this program. Some of it, I'm sure, would be absolutely obvious to you. For instance, the topic that, of course, we would want to engage um, on a issue such as freedom of speech, given this, um, the climate of assaults on civil liberties in this country and elsewhere. Um, but why darkness and why a seminar series? It all began with a film by Amar Kanwar entitled Such a Morning. And we had the privilege of having it screened yesterday at Union Docs. And I want to thank Union Docs again for making it possible. And I'd also like to acknowledge Marion Goodman Gallery, which helped with the screening and which is showing that film in an installation with um, a larger exhibition of Amar's work opening on Wednesday. Um, the film is called Such a Morning and is a parable in Kanwar's own words, and I'm quoting here, a parable about two people's quiet engagement with truth, navigating multiple transitions between speech and silence, democracy and fascism, fear and freedom. In the cusp between the eye and the mind, shifting time brushes every moment into new potencies, each character seeks the truth through phantom visions from within the depths of darkness. Such a Morning is an extraordinary film, um, at once very precise and specific, and yet withholding any kind of prescriptive solution or suggestions, but opening instead a space to reflect collectively on how we might learn and understand, how we might develop alignments and communities of affinities, and how we might engage in and with activism and belief. With the film came the invitation expressed in a letter accompanying the film that was sent from, quote, the depths of darkness to help mine a topic that is unknown, that is dark because we cannot see it. Um, and that is where the Verily Center picked up the proposition or the invitation by Amar. And um, we decided that well into the first and what some of us hope is the last term of the current um, US administration, we recognize that uh, our darkness at the moment is freedom of speech. Um, in this ruthless erosion of freedom of speech into hate speech, in the crackdown on civil liberties and freedom of the press, but also in the midst of exhilarating counter movements such as Black Lives Matter, Me Too, or the New Red Order, we seem to be cl quite clear that freedom of speech is the, um, the darkness that we would want to focus on. Um, we want to uh, focus on it in terms of legal, social, and cultural terms, um, but we also want to look at the Speech Act itself and see to what extent we might even disconnect it from the idea of speaking words. Um, but why a seminar? Um, obviously, the topic is incredibly complex, and there is a um, deep need or desire, certainly, to learn, and also the recognition that we can only learn with and from others. Um, so we decided to extend the seminar series for an entire year, and in your program you have a list of upcoming seminars. The next one is dedicated to many manif feminist manifestos in this curated by a um, graduate student at the New School, Gabriela lopez Denia. Um, we also meant with a seminar that there would be the opportunities to learn more and to read and to do homework and fulfill assignments, so to speak. So um, online on the Verily Center's website and in response to your signing up for the seminars, you will in, in advance of each seminar get readings and texts, etc. 
Um, it also meant that um, through the extension we would be able to engage in partnerships with organizations whose work we have followed for a long time and who we deeply admire, recognizing that only in a joint exploration of these topics can we really advance if we step outside our own uh, boundaries of thinking. Those organizations are the New York Peace Institute, Weeksville Heritage Society, Article 19, and I'm listing them in sequence of our engagement with them. So tonight's partner is the National Coalition Against Censorship, um, guided by program director um, Svetlana Mincheva. So each seminar, with a few exceptions, is developed in collaboration with these fantastic partner organizations. Um, a word about the format tonight. So Svetlana Mincheva, who is again program director of the um, National Coalition Against Censorship, will organize and moderate and also introduce a discussion amongst um, a number of presenters who come from different um, backgrounds and are Mark Bray, a political organizer, historian of human rights, terrorism and political radicalism in modern Europe and an author. As well, Abu Farman um, is assistant professor in anthropology at the New School. Amar Kanwar is joining us, artist and filmmaker based in New Delhi. Mendy and Kiz Obadike, who are artists and professors at Pratt and um, members of the advisory committee of the Verilis Center. And Vanessa Place, a r artist, writer, and criminal appellate attorney, attorney specializing in sex offenders and sexually violent predators. Um, they will engage in a conversation, again moderated by Svetlana, and then in the second half of this um, seminar, we're opening it up to everyone and hope you will all participate um, with responses, responses to what we've heard offered by members and representatives of the partner organizations and everyone else who is so inclined to join us. I, before I hand the microphone over to Svetlana, I want to thank um, the staff of the Verlis Center, Emily Donnelly and Nina Olivetti, Gabriela Lopez Denia, who is again the Verlis Center Art and Social Justice Fe graduate student fellow and organizer of the next uh, um, seminar, and all of you. And with that, onwards to a new journey of learning, which comes from another letter of Amar Kanwar's. Okay. Thank you, and Svetlana, why don't you um, come up here? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Karen, um, and the Viralist Center, and uh, Laura Rykovich and Gabby for organizing this very timely and necessary conversation and inviting the National Coalition Against Censorship to partner in it. The subject of free speech today, I think, is kind of like less than darkness is suffering from overexposure. There's not a day when there's not five articles somewhere about free speech. And there's more and more said and written every day, and positions are consolidated, territories are stake, the camps are formed, everything is reinforced. And I think, kind of paradoxically, that's when we need to, to take a fresh look, to sort of look at free speech maybe uh, obliquely, and to remap the territory because with like we it's too you know in a way this overexposure could be just as blinding and uh, creating a sort of invisibility as as darkness. Um, NCAC, my organization, was formed in 1974 in a very very completely different uh, political environment, and many of its initial supporters were activists from the civil rights years. I joined in 2000, um, and even at that point, there was a still living and relatively fresh memory of kind of farther back the McCarthy era, the civil rights movement, and more recently at that point, the culture wars over the, over the NEA. So in that atmosphere, free speech was seen on the liberal side as a deeply cherished value. I was doing good work, and it was kind of, you know, it was pleasing. I felt good. Um, and then uh, there was also the new visibility of previously suppressed dissidents from the recently uh, disintegrated Soviet bloc, which again contributed to this, the value of free speech. Um, 
and having free speech is a, is a good thing. At the same time, um, nobody was blind to the lopsided distribution of free speech rights in a society where economic and social power determines access, determines whether you have a voice, determines whether you can get out on the platforms where people could hear you. Uh, not everybody had access to news, uh, equal access to news sources, to publishing, to cultural institutions. But the problem was not so much seen as a problem of speech. It was seen as a problem of unequal access. And that seemed to change. And there was a major shift um, sometime between 2014 and 2017. Um, we, and it was, it's on many levels. And free speech is not like a, a single isolated thing. So what shifted, you know, we had an economic and political polarization reaching levels that were unprecedented in a liberal democracy. Uh, then the utopian promise of the internet to give everybody access to a platform crashed and morphed into something very sinister. And we can talk about that for a long time. And then a new generation came of age with a very laudable commitment to social justice, but no personal visceral memory of major government efforts to suppress speech. So recently a friend said to me, I admire your continued persistent defense of free speech. And he said it in a, in a sort of pitying manner, <laughs> as if addressing someone who is well-meaning but deluded, someone stubbornly defending a sinking ship. And here I am, still <laughs> believing the ship, that ship should be kept afloat. And that for it to be kept afloat, we should defend the principle of free speech for all. Not free speech for me, but not for thee. And so uh, here is what I want to propose as my contribution to the map of the territory. Um, so my, one of my um, uh, principles here is free speech is not an abstract category. It's, they're no, we're not talking about free speech as ev everything. It is a very specific relationship between people. There's no such thing as a literally free speech. There are always constraints of language, of social codes, of protocols of engagement. Totally unconstrained speech may be something like a primal scream, but I don't even know that that is speech. So when we talk about free speech, we're talking about something very different and very specific, a relationship between people within a particular structure of governance. And in that sense, free speech is inevitably related to power and authority as a limitation on power, rather than the positive fulfillment of some undefined freedom. So free speech is about limits on power, and it is about relationship between people. And the First Amendment encodes that limitation. It states, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say that everyone should speak free of any constraint, ethical, personal, or linguistic. So the First Amendment is a limit set on government power. And the interpretation of this very terse amendment has taken a century uh, and thousands and thousands of pages of legal opinion. Uh, so it is, it is a kind of living law. It changes all the time. So when we have calls today to ban new categories of speech, that could be successful. That could happen. My question is, do we want that to happen? I'm opening this. Um, and then another thing to consider is that today, First Amendment protections don't really matter that much because power over information is de facto held by private companies. We have, the government may be barred uh, from uh, censoring speech based on its viewpoint, but private companies are not. And this includes print media, internet platforms, publishers, film studios, private museums, and universities. Those are the institutions that are forming our increasingly privatized public sphere. There is no law preventing those institutions from discriminating against whatever viewpoints they wish suppressed at any moment. And the goal of my work in advocacy has been to have those institutions allow for more speech, for art expressing different perspectives, whether they're about sexuality, about politics, about religion. So when such efforts come from the religious right, I find plenty of support and admiration among my friends. When the Smithsonian, a few years back, deplatformed David Wojnarowicz's fire in my belly, 
It reminded everyone of uh, Rudy Giuliani's efforts to deplatform Chrysophily from the Brooklyn Museum, and the art world rose up in arms unanimously. But recent demands to deplatform and blacklist speech and speakers directed at those institutions have split traditional allies apart. And that applies to the Whitney, to the Guggenheim, to um, uh, the uh, ICA Boston with the Dana Schutz shows and so on. So I'd say that those who advocate, and I'm sure <laughs> there are those among us, for the suppression of bad speech, speech that we all agree is noxious, should always be clear as to who shares the implied consensus of we. <coughs> who are we talking about when we say we? And who has the power to suppress and to define vague categories such as uh, hate speech right now in this society? So um, you probably read that PayPal last week decided to deny services both to neo-Nazis and to um, Antifa as extremist organizations. So they are, they're going to both sides of the spectrum and nobody is protected. So surely speech can have effects. It could hurt feelings. It, it can inspire hatred or revolutionary fervor. It could, subvert, uh, it could uh, subvert support for law enforcement, remind of past traumas, or question the status quo. If it didn't, it didn't need protection. Which is why we can read books criticizing religious <coughs> dogmas. Uh, we can uh, read books advocating armed rebellion or changing property rights. So over half a century, last century, the Supreme Court shifted its criterion as to whether speech need to be suppressed if, um, uh, from, uh, from uh, judging speech by its bad tendency to advocate for bad behavior or um, illegal things to whether it presents an incitement to immediate lawless action. And that was a major shift. So speech that might have a bad tendency to, um, to provoke people to think in a particular bad way, that was protected. And under the bad tendency text, uh, criterion and, and test, the people who went to jail were communists, anti-war protesters, people that would, pro would probably find sympathetic. Um, so opposing the principle of free speech, which is a limitation on power, necessarily constitutes a demand for more authority and more power. But do we really want to give more control to those in power, be they government, social media giants, or even cultural institutions? And surely pressure on liberal cultural institutions to exclude certain voices often works. But who profits from a polarized atmosphere where political disagreement is met with moral opprobrium and treated as a contaminant to be put under quarantine? Locking ourselves in echo chambers of consensus and outrage and denying there is anything to learn about the political other may be comforting, but is it a strategy that could change the country as a whole for the better? Or is it a dangerous risk given that a common tool used to manipulate the population into accepting fascism is that of dividing society into tribes of polar opposite beliefs. So that's my, that's my uh, part of the territory. <laughs> um, so we'll proceed by, uh, we'll, we'll um, invite our other um, main participants to speak for five minutes each, and then we'll proceed to a discussion. Uh, hi, everyone. I feel like there are very few participants where I'm looking, so I'm just going to kind of <laughs> look around. You and all to come closer. That would be very nice. Okay. Um, so I think it, my remarks will, would be better understood if I give a little background of where I'm coming from on this. I wrote a book called Antifa, the Anti-Fascist Handbook, explaining and actively supporting anti-fascist politics. So I have been asked about questions surrounding speech quite a bit. Uh, in my book, I have a chapter about that topic, but I'm gonna make a few comments with the struggle against the alt-right as my main point of reference, but I think that the, the, some of these comments are, are really more generally applicable. So uh, I, I'm gonna echo a, a lot of what Svetlana said, that the, the conversation around speech is often had 
without a lot of the most important underlying assumptions uh, being addressed. So there's this assumption that in the United States we have pristine freedom of speech and that any kind of media spectacle of an artist being censored or a speaker being shut down is destroying sort of this otherwise pristine landscape. But it's important to recognize that one, free speech absolutism is impossible. Uh, all kinds of rights are limited by other rights in a complex society. And second, there are all sorts of limits on speech, whether it be copyright, libel, uh, obscenity, and so forth. You can agree or disagree with them, but the question for me isn't uh, unlimited free speech or not. It's how do we uh, adjudicate between all these different considerations. It's also really important to make a di distinction between legal limitations on speech and uh, sort of societal cultural taboos. Uh, that distinction is often not made. And so there are times when political movements are making arguments about uh, what they would argue are, for example, white supremacist or patriarchal speakers or groups that don't always involve arguing that the state should ban this group or that kind of speech. So that's important. I agree with Svetlana that it's, it really needs to be understood in context, not in the abstract, and it needs to be understood politically. The kind of origins of the notion of free speech rights as we have them, of course, are inextricably intertwined in the history of liberalism, liberal politics that attempts to render itself invisible by playing the role of uh, alleged moderator in society. So I think it's important to always push back against that, regardless of your stance on this position, and think of all kind of rights in political context. There have been, of course, really important debates over the past 200 years or so between, roughly speaking, advocates of kind of classical liberal rights and different kinds of socialists, where you have the basic argument goes something like, uh, classical liberal says everyone has the equal right to fill in the blank. The socialist or Marxist or anarchist says that's all very well and good, but if you have it in a capitalist society, if you have it in a society where you have an oppressive state, what do the rights really mean in practice? And for me, that's what this conversation is about. What does the right to free speech, understood not exclusively in terms of what the state does, but also in terms of what we do as a society, what does that mean in the context that we're living in? And how, what's the difference between speech, uh, the speech of an individual versus the speech, the political propaganda of a movement or an organization? That's often conflated. So the, 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 the term deplatforming grows out of the slogan developed by the British anti-fascist movement in the 1970s, no platform for fascism. And for decades and decades, and, well, not that, you can count the decades, <laughs> for several decades, it specifically primarily referred to no platform for fascist organizations like the National Front. Talking about it a little bit in the context of the university, I think is apropos. Uh, if we want to think about speech, not just in the abstract, but in the material, I think it's important to think about who is empowered and who is not empowered to actually meaningfully participate. Again, the difference between a kind of abstract right and a right in practice. So in the context of a university, what's the difference between saying everyone at the university has the right to say whatever they want without reference to politics and um, therefore allowing, for example, um, a white student union to make an argument about white genocide that people of color are destroying the tradition of the United States and therefore potentially likely making people that are the targets of their uh, oppressive ideas feel less empowered to speak versus um, a kind of empowered notion of speech that recognizes that if you actually in in substance want as many different people from different backgrounds to actually feel like they can participate that may involve not necessarily explicit bans, but at least popular taboos against being a white supremacist, for example. And so for me, if you have a situation where you have uh, a white supremacist group or an alt-right group going around um, making apologies for all sorts of oppressive ideas, saying that Hitler was right, does that mean that Jewish students feel empowered to speak on equal terms? Maybe, maybe not. There's been a lot of pundit panic, Svetlana touched upon that. A lot of pundit panic about speech that, for example, someone like Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos being shut down would inevitably cascade, quote unquote, civilization down this terrifying slope into tyranny. 
hasn't really happened, uh, which isn't to say that there aren't legitimate concerns around shutting down speakers, but all too often this conversation has not happen happened in reference to actual empirical evidence about what the ramifications are of organizing against such individuals and groups. So returning again to my area of focus, anti-fascism, I haven't yet seen a mainstream pundit write about the alleged danger of no platforming a fascist with actual reference to the decades of empirical evidence around what that has produced around the world. This is not a movement that popped up overnight. It's existed for decades. If you want to make an argument about what it does or doesn't do, try looking at what it's done in the past. I can get into that more, but uh, I want to respect the five minute limit here. Uh, so to, to wrap up, um, For me, the, de the debate around speech can't simply happen solely around speech, but also has to happen around values and politics. For me, the argument isn't whether or not a given group or individual ought to be accepted by society for what they present in the abstract as uh, just about speech, but also about what are the actual tangible ramifications of having an alt-right group or equivalent group in your community or in your society. And given the recent shootings and bombings and stabbings, this has very real ramifications that can't be ignored. Uh, it's not just about abstract rights. And beyond the sort of question of organizing against the alt-right, what does it mean in a capitalist society when the actual lived experience of expressing yourself is very much filtered through economic issues, Svetlana touched upon that, not to mention the role of incarceration, the role of deportation of undocumented people, there, not to mention the, the, the United States government's support for oppressive regimes around the world for waging wars. If you are killed in a war, you'll lose a lot more than just your freedom of speech. So again, regardless of your take, let's situate it in all of these various issues and not just leave it in the abstract. I think that hopefully most of us can agree about that. So thank you. Hi, so I'm, I'm Keith. I'm Mindy. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how these ideas relate to our projects. We uh, are artists and we collaborate together. Um, yeah, so we, we have, we've chosen five points of entry for, our, for, for us um, and they all center around something that has to do with our work and they, um, the touch points for us are also about both the rights of the hearer and um, freedom of speech as control of data. Uh, so recently, uh, President Trump has been in the news for attacking journalists, and specifically over the last week, people have been talking about his attacks on uh, black women journalists. And this made us think about uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, the journalist who was working at the turn of the uh, last century, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and in 1895, she put out a book called The Red Record. And we used that book uh, for a project maybe about three years ago uh, called Number Station, The Red Record, uh, where we sonified data from Ida B. Wells' book. Um, so Wells was a journalist and an activist who founded and ran her own newspaper uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And the book, The Red Record, was a kind of staggering document of American violence. It was lynching statistics. Uh, and she pulled those statistics from, from police records uh, and from newspapers. Uh, and, and so as we were working with the book, we wondered what made Wells think that she could publish this, right? Not, not, you know, not just why did she do it, but what made her think that she could do it. And so we were curious about what kind of conversations were happening around free speech, specifically uh, with African Americans in the late 19th century. Um. So here's one point. Free speech concerns used to be very localized and regional. Uh, roughly 30 years earlier um, than, than Wells was dealing with this um, data mining project, um, a group of abolitionists meeting in Boston were attacked by a racist mob. And Frederick Douglass went to the site of the attack and made appeals for free speech based on the notion that Boston should see itself differently from the slaveholding South. 
Um, it's hard to know whether Douglas actually believed that Boston had a different political climate or not, but that was the argument he made to the citizens of Boston. Uh, our next point is that uh, data control is a free speech issue. Um, Uh, so after Ida B. Wells published the Red Record, uh, she came under attack uh, by white mobs in, in Memphis. Uh, and even though uh, much of the information that she published in the Red Record had been collected and had been made public in other ways, uh, there was something um, very powerful about the fact that she chose to publish it. Uh, so her, her newspaper was attacked, it was burned down, uh, she was threatened, and she escaped. Uh, Memphis and moved to Chicago to continue her work there. Uh, now, so we both have Douglas uh, sort of characterizing Boston as maybe a place different from the slaveholding South and, and Ida B. Wells moving to Chicago uh, for sanctuary. And you know, if you know these cities, it's quite ironic that people would move to Chicago and Boston to, to escape uh, racism. Uh, so what what was it that they imagined they might find in, in, in these cities in the north, right? Um, and, and, and what uh, was the suppression of black speech unique in the way that it happened in the American South? Um, next point is the rights of the hearer. Frederick Douglass made the point during his speech in Boston that suppressing free speech violates not only the speaker, but also the hearer. A generation after Wells, singer and activist Paul Robeson took his crusade for human rights against fascism to the international stage and echoed the same point. We met his granddaughter um, and had long conversations with her about her research and documentation of his life. And one of the stories she told us that we were really struck by was a story about a moment when, during the Spanish Civil War, when Robeson went to the front lines and, um, and sang to the troops, briefly halting the war. He saw the struggle for free speech as an international one, saying every artist, every scientist, every writer must decide now where he stands. There is no standing above the conflict on Olympian heights. There are no impartial observers. The battlefront is everywhere. Um, it is important to note that Robeson's struggle for free speech was against different powers. So there was a moment when he was going to send a message uh, to England um, and um, there were different people who, who organized against him. The Nazis um, wanted to jam the signal, and, and some in England and the US were also against um, him, him um, making the, the message from Russia. And so uh, he was really outraged that this, this um, suppression was coming from very different um, political uh, stances. After Robeson was brought before Huac, uh, his passport was seized and his voice was largely silenced. The obvious point was not just to limit Robeson's speech, but also to limit an international audience access to him. Uh, next again, we return to this idea that uh, data control is a free speech issue. So today it's easier than ever for artists uh, and activists to find and communicate with an international audience. The terms are much different than they were in Robeson's time. Uh, however, the dominant platforms for communication are not in the control of the individual, as we all know. Uh, from 2011 to 16, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter work with an, a company called Geophedia. Uh, Geophedia gave information to the police about activists so that uh, activists could be located in real time as they, as they posted to uh, social media. Uh, now, once this was made public uh, by the ACLU and other organizations, uh, around 2017, the, the dominant social media platforms sort of dumped uh, Geophedia. Uh, but but the, the conflict here is not just that uh, people are being monitored on social media platforms, but also these very platforms uh, are seeking to engage activists, right? So, so they're going to organizations like Black Lives Matter uh, and saying, please use our platform, and then offering uh, that data uh, to the police. Um, and then our last point, we're thinking about the right to vote as a free speech issue. Um, as we all know, last week the U.S. held midterm elections, and control of data is one of the issues that has emerged across the races. Um, but we're thinking about it particularly in relation to the governor's race in Georgia. 
Um, I've been volunteering on Stacey Abrams' campaign, both because I'm very interested in her issues and strategies, but also we've known her for quite a long time. And she's been committed to not only those issues, but also vote, voting rights issues um, for the last 30 years. Um, according to Abrams' opponent, who up until a few days ago was also the election official in charge of the race, um, he has won the race. Uh, Georgia voters have spoken, he said. It's time for Abrams to listen and concede immediately. Um, but Abrams has refused to concede the race on the grounds that we not only um, know that there are they're more votes coming out, but these votes are for, a lot of them are for her, but even the ones that we don't know yet, um, every day there are more votes um, that are uncounted coming from precincts that have reported that all votes are in and accounted for. And so it's not just that they're not voted, that they're, they're not counted, but that they were previously not known to exist. Um, and so, um, I have more to say on that, but, but what I will um, share is that um, Lauren Wargargo, the campaign manager, says that voter suppression looks a lot of different ways, and one of the ways that it looks like is a database error. I, uh, as some people here know, I, I work closely with the sanctuary movement, so most of what I will say has to do uh, with that zone and, and I will try and um, talk about the virtues of darkness and the power of silence. So a different angle into this, very much on the side. And so for mapping, I guess, the territory here, I'll be doing the basement and the underground and the cave and those places where darkness and silence are a source of power um, for the future. Um, and I'll start by saying that, you know, one of the things uh, that is assumed by uh, anything to do with free speech is a kind of a public realm uh, for which an appearance is required. And that appearance may not be available to some people. Um, and that appearance may be a trap because for an undocumented person, you appear when you're caught. Uh, when you're asked for an ID, when you are uh, caught in DWI, uh, driving while immigrant, um, and in those kinds of circumstances. So um, Lewis Gordon has this, this uh, using Fanon, has this very nice uh, set of passages on appearance, but what he calls it the disaster of appearance for certain people where uh, uh, um, Appearance is never nonviolent. So the public realm, in many instances, is always, always violent. Um, um, for, you know, for black, for racialized, for undocumented trans indigenous bodies, uh, that's often the case, and that's the, that's the that's the trap because uh, uh, appearance is not just a disaster; it's also impossible in a way because you're always interpolated, uh, not as a subject but as a suspect. Um, as abject, as alien, as outsider, as foreigner, as illegal, as criminal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, uh, clearly you are not appearing a category is. Um, and so in that sense, I think those places of hiding where we keep away from that sort of interpolation uh, is actually necessary and good, and it reminds me of a passage that Hannah Arendt has, um, weirdly, in, a, in, a, in an essay, um, well-known essay on education, but where she talks about the fact that all living beings, well, she talks about the security um, of being uh, hidden from the world uh, and, and the fact that every living being, although uh, uh, always needing to move towards the light and grow in the light, also comes out of the darkness to begin with and always needs the security of darkness to continue growing. And so I think I want to appeal to that darkness. Uh, I think partly uh, uh, Amara's film was also a place where the darkness actually uh, was yielding something, where you had to retreat in order to return. Right? Um, so, so 
in the you know in the sanctuary movement um we do uh in we, we have two two places of silence in fact that are power uh, one is that we tell people allies white allies who come to accompany uh folks to official encounters with say an ice uh, at, at an ice check in with an ice officer or uh, in the courts um or with judges, or at hospitals, anywhere where there's that danger of being interpolated, uh, we ask citizens uh, to accompany as a as a kind of shelter, as a kind of of security, and um, uh, the instruction that they receive in doing that work is to shut up, is not to speak, because if they speak, if they exercise in rage, the freedom of speech that is their entitlement but not the entitlement of those they're accompanying, they put in danger not themselves but the vulnerable people they are with. Right? So in that case, it is important for them to not say anything even at that point where they are seeing something that needs to be said, uh, to be spoken out, to be pointed out. Right? So that's one, one instance and I think we can s uh, theorize more out of that. The other one is um, uh, it's right here. I don't know who printed these, but thank you. It's just wonderful. Everybody should pick some of this up. Um, but it's it's the 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 card, the Know Your Rights card that we carry. The first thing is that uh, I'm choosing to exercise my right to say nothing, to be silent, uh, because uh, right because th that's the Miranda right and so on and so forth. And th maybe it, it's that too much has been made of it. But that right to remain silent um, is crucial in those situations because not only what you say may be used against you, but the situation is set up so that anything you say will be used against you uh, with ICE. There's always that uh, attempt to get you to do things so that you can deport yourself. Right? So remaining silent is the place where you start and that you can at least have something um, that will not trap you, and, and then there are things that we can do after. But I, w you know, I want to I want to say that and move out of it for a second uh, beyond the sort of the Miranda Miranda. So it's funny because also I was just looking at some stuff, but in some of the police sites um, now, there Miranda was um, a, a U.S. citizen, but in some of the police sites, I've seen him being referred to as a, 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 a Mexican immigrant yeah. these days. Yeah, um, so that's a new. It's, uh, yeah, it's a new spin on, on Miranda. Um, uh, but, but so, you know, I mean, uh, uh, during the, undocu so the undocumented movement, and some of the stuff I'm going to say is also kind of weird because a lot of what has come out since the 2007 and the founding of the sanctuary movement and so on has actually been the imperative for undocumented folks to tell their stories. People have been saying, you know, in a way we're undocumented, not just in relation to the technologies of citizenship, um, right, but also because we're unstoried, um, because our lives have not been documented and so on, so there was this need to say, um, let us tell our stories, put on a human face, blah, 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 all of that stuff, and that's been done, and, and people continue to say it, but I'm suspicious of it because a story always has a narrative arc, it always requires a form, it always requires a certain kind of movement, and if you look at all those stories, and they've been told, it's not like they haven't been told, we're not being denied our rights because the voice hasn't come out, because it hasn't been spoken, right? But if you look at all those stories, Isn't it mostly books where they uh, uh, I'm 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 speaking as best as I can, sir. Well, I will do what I can, and if you can't hear it, I'm very very sorry. I hope that you will understand what I'm saying in deeper ways than that. Thank you. <coughs> um. I should have exercised my right to silence right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I was saying is that a lot of those stories have come out and they replay the tropes, the traps, right, of good immigrant, bad immigrant, of illegal uh, uh, versus legal, of all those stories of, of, of dreamer versus gang member. Those stories end up flowing into a pre-established matrix that makes them legible to the people who don't know those stories, right? For whom that legibility somehow is important. Tell us your stories. There are story vultures now, mm -hmm. right? The vulturing on people's stories. And so in that context, I've heard more and more people saying, we're not gonna tell our stories anymore. We don't need to, we will remain silent. It's what Audra Simpson 
calls the right to refusal, right, as a form of uh, claiming power, of claiming a different kind of power, of refusing the ways in which your story will become some other story. Right? Your voice is no longer a voice that goes through a voice box and turns into some other set of voices. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it uh, a little bit at, at, at that and we can continue, but um, you know, I think there's, there's ways in which, the, for me, the sanctuary movement has taught me that, that some, you know, n not that you always want to claim the silence or always want to claim uh, uh, the speech, but that, that they're, they're constantly working together and uh, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And, and somewhere between the silence uh, and the speech, between the law and somewhere beyond the law, um, um, you know, we can have a, uh, maybe a collective cry uh, as opposed to silence or speech. Thank you for inviting me here. And um, thank you for also, for all of you for responding. Um, I'm, it's not that I have uh, worked uh, theoretically in that sense or analyzed the whole question of the law with respect to speech. Uh, so in a certain way, I'm going to make a few points which are in the context of what triggered me to do my work um, and how perhaps it connects to some of the things that we are speaking about. Um, If I look back at the last 20 years of work, I, I, I think I stepped out of uh, my own life and world, uh, uh, essentially because of a massacre, uh, which in some ways uh, you know, forced me uh, to feel uncomfortable on my own, uh, staying on my own, not responding, and so on. Uh, and if I look at uh, the last 20 years after that, uh, uh, which I don't often look at, but if I were to look at, uh, then I see that I have probably moved from one site of massacre to another site of massacre over and over again in different areas, uh, responding, speaking, uh, trying to understand, uh, trying to speak to other people f to help them understand uh, and so on. Um, along the way, uh, I mean, um, two things uh, continued to happen. One was that, uh, um, of course, uh, I kept trying to find newer and newer ways to respond to the whole question of violence, uh, newer and newer ways to comprehend it, and newer and newer ways to learn to respect just the meaning of respect uh, itself. Um, but the other thing that happened um, to me as well was that um, uh, I think at every site or every inc incident or every individual uh, that I went uh, to and along and by and so on, uh, I was also acutely aware that uh, there was a lot that I left behind. There was a lot that I, uh, it's not that I only encountered uh, uh, what happened. Uh, I'm saying this in the context of the fact that we are speaking for justice or I'm responding in the, in the paradigm of seeking justice. But uh, I did feel that there was a vast territory at every site that uh, I could not comprehend fully. I could not tell it fully. Uh, or a certain right of silence had been uh, kept. Or that I was, I understood, but I was not supposed to say it. Or I understood, but I did not know how to say it. And so if you put this together over 20 years, then I feel that even though I have worked and spoken for so many years, at the same time, I have like a huge basket full of knowing that there is a lot that I, a lot of silence. So at every site, one spoke, but silence also continued. And each silence was of a different kind, 
and a different meaning and a different intensity, and it just carried on and accumulated and accumulated. Uh, I'm not making an argument here. I'm going to move from a few different points because we have just a few minutes. Uh, and I'm jumping a few points to give a context to where I'm coming from. Uh, the, another thing that um, struck me over the years uh, was that um, of, uh, I don't know what the right word for it is, but perhaps I would say is unshakable prejudice. I've dealt with unshakable prejudice with anger, with uh, persuasion, with love, with affection, with the persistence uh, over and over again for years. Uh, with not just the bad guys, but even with near and dear and loved ones as well. And um, it brings me to a certain point where I feel the need that I need to figure this. Maybe I'm not figuring it out. Uh, over the last five, ten years, having been associated with many different kinds of struggles, whether it's on the question of ecology or civil rights or uh, you know, various community rights, religious issues, and so on, um, and, and we are all witnessing what has been happening in the last several years, I began to wonder something that you said that um, uh, of, uh, in the context of the sinking ship, uh, um, so I began to wonder that if the ship is sinking, then uh, maybe I need to find where the hole is. <laughs> so I should plug the hole. And so I started to plug the holes. And it still kept sinking. So then I thought that um, that's something fishy about it, because how, if I've plugged all the holes, why is it sinking? And then I wondered that perhaps I was plugging the holes of the wrong ship. <laughs> maybe I was, so in a sense that made me wonder that maybe there is something that I'm not seeing. And uh, if there is a blind spot, then how would I even ever know it if I do not know where it is? Um, so, which uh, led me uh, to uh, perhaps come to a conclusion, for at least temporarily for myself, was that uh, I felt that I had argued long enough, and that uh, I would like to see as to what is the kind of conversation, what is the, na what nature of conversation would, could perhaps be possible at the end of all arguments? Is there a conversation? And with whom could that conversation be? And what kind of conversation would it be? Where could I place myself to be able to be in the best position possible to even answer these questions that I just raised, again, for myself? Uh, which is why I came to the, to the film, to the question of stepping back, to the need to enter into uh, the heart of darkness, supposedly to a, into a territory where you cannot see anything. And that to see that if I were to enter into the heart of darkness, into a space of non-vision, then what would I see? And what would that vision be? Um, I jump ahead uh, and to, s to put this in some context, and I have to do this briefly because we are moving, uh, that uh, this was also compelled uh, by a desire to uh, find a way to reconfigure. Uh, and um, there is no doubt that, um, again, when we look around, that the desire for violence is uh, is not, it has not disappeared. Um, uh, the, so does the desire for violence only e exist outside, or does it exist inside? Do I need to deal with it as well? And so on and so forth. So um, I, I felt that um, 
this the context of this was that I felt the need to uh, find a, a way and a method to reconstitute, reconfigure, uh, rearticulate, uh, uh, maybe come down temporarily to a zero position and start again to see. Uh, obviously, this cannot be done alone entirely, but it must perhaps be begun alone for a while, was another thing that uh, I felt. Lastly, uh, I've, uh, and I'm jumping to another issue, uh, connected a little bit to what you said with reference to data. And of course, in the context of data manipulation and data, uh, which is something that we have been seeing in India and elsewhere and all over. Um, uh, at one time, they would capture the booth completely, and you know you wouldn't even know that the booth, the voting booth, had been taken over. Uh, or you would uh, capture it and have somebody else uh, stamp, uh, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000 votes. Now it's simpler methodology to to, to do that. However, um, the date, the question of data error that just I would like to flag again uh, is that I felt, uh, and this is my last point, uh, I just I felt that um, very often, say within even within say political struggles or within the right people or the liberal people or the. Uh, uh, f uh, leave alone the, the so-called baddies that one is fighting against, even within our own community, I would find quite often uh, very disturbed people, very angry people. I would find arrogant people. I would find complicated people. Um, you refer to vultures of various kinds. And so again, was I a vulture? Was you, are you a vulture? Are you nice today and are you different tomorrow? Uh, or you, I mean, I don't mean like that, but. <laughs> so, I mean, I felt that I needed to bring that out all, all uh, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, it's true. So who is the carcass as well? So we, I needed to do that. And uh, that triggered me that, yes, perhaps in my street where I live, if I look around, I see a spectrum of fairly weird, complicated, difficult neurosis that we all live with individually. And sometimes we are very, you know, even, even in my own family, somebody could be horrible and remarkably compassionate at the same time. And we can deal with this at a street level, maybe. But if we are dealing and have access to this kind of neurosis, maybe, maybe I'm using the wrong word, but it, uh, maybe the inner, inner self, maybe a better word, if we are, have access to this inner self 24-7, uh, worldwide, coming into you, into our pockets, into our hands, regularly, continuously, for one year, two years, three years, five years, then again we are in a terrain that is completely new. And how can we deal with this kind of terrain? And I'm saying this in the context of censorship, in the context of manipulation, in the context of political struggle. Uh, how do you assess uh, any more? Not just what you're receiving, but what it's doing to you, and what does it do to you if you have access of this scale uh, round the clock? Uh, and again, it's, uh, 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 we need to find a way to, re to, to respond to it, to respond not just to censorship, but to respond even to the crisis of speech, of articulation, and what it is doing to us and to our inner selves. Thank you. Freedom of speech is a particularly American affectation. Like other American affectations, it's schizophilic, loving its incompatible anima and animations. Springing from the self-same well, the raison d'etre of liberty, i.e. that freedom of speech is necessary for freedom itself, and freedom itself necessary for democracy, and democracy necessary for the American. But even as we profess to love our freedom, which, like other loves, has the constant complaint of not enough, we also argue that there is too much freedom, 
meaning freedom from rancor, from abuse, from hate, meaning that we do not love freedom itself, but prefer a more chaste, more consensual form of intercourse. Something enlightening, or at least attractive, something, strictly speaking, productive, something, loosely speaking, beneficial. Babies are supposed to be cute, or at least innocent. So we try to divide the offspring of our freedom into welcome and unwanted children, good speech and bad speech, meaning what we call hate, meaning that which we find ugly. Hate speech is not what is hurtful, but what is hateful. Sometimes it is hate-filled, that calumny that's the most obvious kind, the kind that makes friends and followers furious and predates automatic weaponry in the hands of civilians. Sometimes it is only the news, the announcement of another boatload of migrants going belly up, which now seems merely reportage, or the promise that I can freeze off my belly fat fairly safely, and probably should. But just as there is no point in my legislating the attractiveness of flensing my flesh or the relative cuteness of your baby, who after all may be ugly to the degree that it looks just like you and your family too, there's no purchase in my deeming this speech proper or another speech unprofitable. Like bullets on a schoolhouse floor, it's all just evidence. And of course, ammunition. As a criminal lawyer and arguably a criminal artist, I would like to advocate not for free speech or sp speech that pays off or out, but for criminal speech. Speech that is illicit because it is unlawful, because the law is just evidence, just the regulation of language that regulates the law. Or to quote Saad, who knew something about law and language, only that which is really criminal which rejects the law. Saad naturally wanted to violate the law for the sake of its violation, which is piquant, but beside the point. The point here is provided by Spinoza, who says with more words, the true schismatics are those who condemn other men's writings and seditiously stir up the quarrelsome masses against their authors. The real disturbers of the peace are those who in a free state seek to curtail the liberty of judgment, which they are unable to tyrannize over. Between these two very good points is the point of indifference. Indifference to all law, to what constitutes our regulation, disregard for what is considered either good manners or good morality, to what is, in a word, authority. The criminal has no working authority, only the ability to be indifferent to the presence of the police. This is true regardless whether the police are there to serve and protect or surveil and brutalize, because there is not one without the other. The United States has a robust history of police restriction on speech, but it is important here to remember that much of, much of this history is civilian. Someone complained that someone else was abusing the platform. The public square, the pulpit, the pamphlet, the theater turned porno. Today, of course, that platform is often what we casually call social, which is an important distinction both legally and socially, for there are no civil liberties on private property. And if our largest platforms are all private, all social, then there is no place to speak that is protected when that speech is purposefully antisocial, criminal. Spinoza notes that the supplication to authority is always directed towards the law and towards the applauding multitude, which in a democracy functions as the authority. In the contemporary, the applause, like the multitude, is virtual and viral. It's execution before its trial because the platform is the chopping block. Take away my platform and you take away my speech. This is a good analogy because the tradition of the last words of the condemned began as a public plea made before the guillotine. And if the call was moving enough as a protestation of innocence or genuine repentance, the crowd would be duly moved and the life spared. Today, the soon to be executed are miked after they're strapped down to a gurney and hooked up to a lethal IV, invited to say a few words and then definitively shut up. Platformed and deplatformed, one being meaningless without its other. I have been excised from various platforms by way of being blocked, being boycotted, being petitioned against, being uninvited from conferences, performances, public and private conversations. And by the way, thank you for your permission to speak and by being threatened with various forms of bodily and otherwise professional harm because of my indifference to the law of the platform. My indifference lies both in my speech and in my refusal to speak, that is, to signal how my speech should sound in the ear so that its message is rightly sounded. For the other aspect of the freedom of speech not often mentioned is the freedom not to speak, to refuse to say even upon demand. 
Here's where the First Amendment meets the fifth, that famous right to remain silent, even when the cops ask you to sing. Now, as you may suspect, I'm making an argument against the public apology or the pirouette of virtue signaling that the platform demands of the condemned. In this sense, even the notion of deplatforming is a little bit comforting, for the platform never forgets. Google me. There will be some accusations that I am an artist and some declarations that I am a racist. Some sites will say that I am a criminal defense attorney who represents sex offenders on appeal. Some will say I am a rape apologist, all based on roughly the same set of facts. It's not my job to de-stain the screen or purge the platform. I'm not a historian or a cop just another criminal. My bias is that I believe in the stupidity and necessity of the personal, that contingent and errant sack of skin that keeps one in and out to varying degrees. Saad says, relative to the criminal, by what right does he who have nothing be enchained by an agreement which protects only him who has everything? The platform has everything, including the platform. We can people it as we like along party lines, listening to only that which we deem moral or social, which is to say that which is appropriate, treating speech like wine as if it should intoxicate or agitate or otherwise complement what will surely be our last meal. But again, Spinoza, brains are as diverse as palates. And again, Saad, it would be no less absurd than dangerous to require that those who are to ensure the perpetual immoral subversion of the established order themselves be moral beings. Criminals are not moral beings. However, they may be and often are ethical. Ethics can be ugly, like art. For real freedom has a body count, including cute babies. And perhaps the problem of the platform is not our American love of liberty, but our slavish devotion to safety. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me how this, um, sort of we're talking about free speech, but we're talking about violence more and more, about like story vultures, about violence, about safety and violence. And I'm wondering whether, I mean, uh, and uh, I don't know, like to what extent are we talking about us, like humans as uh, uh, existing in language, existing through stories and existing and those stories being uh, involved in you know, political, personal, power struggles, these stories being like, you, you know, the, the violence that could be done to your story or the violence that, um, that language and speech itself can do. Um, is this something that's kind of like much more than free speech? And should we be thinking about free speech in that way? Or should we be thinking of free speech in a narrower way? And I think what Mendy and Keith were talking about, you know, both, um, Data privacy, you know, there is a way to approach data privacy through the prism of free speech in a very positive way and saying, you know, you need data, and the UN has done that, you need uh, privacy of your data to be able to speak on those social platforms. So it is a, the right to free speech is a good wedge to get certain other rights, as well as voter rights, uh, approach them as free speech, as a very political right. But there is also this kind of interaction of, of language and, um, and people that, that contains violence. Are we trying to legislate something that, um, you know, a kind of a relationship between humans that are beyond the law, that could not be legislated, that, that would do damage by legislating? That's speculation on the subject. <laughs> Thinking about freedom of speech in this way, or do you mean in, in general? Uh, do you mean that are we trying to legislate? Yeah. When you say, are we trying to legislate something that is beyond that? Do you mean in by the terms of this conversation, or more broadly? Well, by putting demands on the law on, on free speech, which I understand as a kind of legal political concept, putting on it the burden of resolving, perhaps, issues that are um, much broader politically, but also, also personal, also matters of um, you know, violence in, in interaction of people through language. Mm -hmm. So can that be, can that be uh, regulated? 
uh, can regulation help in that? Or is it something that, you know, is, is beyond regulation? And if we're regulating, can more balance be done through the regulation rather than resolution? It's not, it's not a question, it's a speculation. Well, one thing that occurred to me, a couple of things. One was when you were saying that, that phenomenon that I saw on social media of somebody would see an incident of, and put it up on, film it, put it up on social media, call for the person to be fired, call for the person to be, have the community turn against them. And then taking your initial remarks, the other thing I kept thinking of is it seems like with this notion of regulation and calling upon, it's like a version of calling a different kind of cop, only the community is the cop. And so are we getting to this point where actually what it is is we just want medium speech. So speech that is neither too much here or too much there, so that speech has to be some sort of, in some way, not extreme on either end. So it's like antidepressant, you know, it's like Prozac speech. There's this idea we should just clip the ends and exist in this kind of middle ground where nothing bad can happen. And what makes me, what gives me concern is the, one, the deferral to and exporting into a kind of another authority, whether it's the community take vengeance upon this person for their noxiousness or regulate so that I don't have to be exposed to it, so I'm protected from the nox from the extreme. Uh, I think that's an important question, but um, when we talk about cops, I do think we should also bear in mind the literal meaning, and there's an important distinction between, of course, a cop who can put someone in a cage and taboo, which in a certain metaphorical sense can shut people up and play a cop in that sense, but doesn't necessarily put someone in a cage or physically harm them. It could, but it doesn't necessarily. And so for me, uh, I'm suspicious of the notion of extremism as a thing. Uh, to compare someone who's extremely anti-racist to someone who's extremely racist, the, the, the horseshoe theory for me is, is bankrupt, and I'm very suspicious of the use of it. And so for me, uh, there is always going to be social taboo against different values. There always has been. There always will be. And for me, the question is not even primarily about speech so much as it is the ongoing, never-ending public contestation over what kind of society do we want, what kinds of values do we accept. And for me, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether we should put someone in a cage or beat them up for having those values. But nevertheless, if you see someone, for example, uh, you know, uh, berating someone in a racist way in a video, and you call their boss and say, hey, I don't think you should have this person as an employee at your law firm. To me, that's a, of a very different kind of category of public sanction, public taboo, which I, I'm actually a fan of certain taboos because they're a lot more effective and if done right, if we could actually get beyond the notion of having to beat people up or cage them to enforce them, could be a way of actually getting beyond this impasse to create a society where maybe, at the very least, racist people could just shut up. Uh, which, of course, is not the way that change happens, but it is an important measure of that change. Um, so that's my take. I'm sure that some folks have a, a different opinion about that. I'm also intrigued um, that the word evidence has come up because um, it's something that I think about a lot in relationship to Amar's films, that oftentimes there are these poetics of creating evidence through the artwork, um, making, doing that documentary work in order to locate evidence of crimes um, in, a, in a certain very specific poetic um, language. And I think there seems to be, in this conversation anyway, a kind of struggle between how we should react in relationship or how, how government and authority relates to how we behave and how we behave in a contract within and amongst people. I think that's sort of a delineation that's come up in this conversation. 
And I guess there are two things that I'm thinking about. One is, um, and perhaps this relates um, in some pretty profound ways to what Abu was saying earlier around sanctuary, is that in some cases having this conversation, even just within this group of people, is a withdrawal from the larger public, even though we're framing it as a public seminar. And, you know, in a way, one of the most profound things that came up last night, I think, in the conversation specifically about Amar's film was whether or not we're even speaking in the right register of justice. And I think that that, for me, was a really particularly powerful moment because we oftentimes think that we're speaking the same language around justice and what that looks like. And oftentimes it's completely a different relationship. And, you know, that's become clear to me in some conversations around notions of sanctuary because what's a safe space for me may exclude you and what your safe location is may exclude me. And so where do we come together then to have this conversation about how do we, do we want to even create a space of justice? What does that look like? And how do we therefore interact around it? Um, I'll take the, the sanctuary uh, prompt to take the mic but not talk about sanctuary. Um, <laughs> But I'm thinking about I mean what, what you brought up, but, but in terms of um, I guess I, I, on my anthropologist side, some part of me always thinks in a functionalist way and thinking, well, what does something that has a popular uh, social polit political presence, what function does it serve uh, somewhere? And I think you know what function does um, the freedom of speech as this kind of American. Uh, uh, um, this this particular right that America holds up uh, um, more than probably most other places, what function do, that does that serve? And I keep thinking of the way you know. I mean, on some level, it's the enshrinement not just of speech, of, but of the right to 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 differ, right? To have different opinions, to have those extremes that you you are talking about, as opposed to the prosaic middle. Um, uh, but right, that right to differ is also coming at the expense of certain notions that we also have about justice and equality. Uh, so, so it's uh, you know it's coming to the surface as as the as the thing that's most enshrined amongst all rights. Uh, for me, kind of helps. Uh, I think of it as something that also obscures uh, those other possibilities of us thinking about uh, um, justice in a way that's not about. Uh, difference all the time, right? But some, something else. And I'm not sure what that is. I've been saying recently in talks, you know, make sanctuary not art. Um, to somehow mark that differently. How, what if we end up thinking about these kinds of things not as some sort of individual expression of opinion and emotion and all of those things, but really thought about uh, um, practices and valuing practices of, of, uh, of community making. Um, uh, without sacrificing this, this you know, because the idea usually is, oh, those kinds of things don't ha leave room for the individual, and you know, w we're all such nice individualists with with such a range of expressions and differences. But what would it what would it take to have that safe space, that community? It doesn't even have to be all that safe in terms of the the middle, but but just in the sense that uh, uh, the trust, the building, those kinds of things are there uh, without. Uh, enshrining just the, the necessity to say my thing uh, uh, alone, and then the second thing is in terms of regulation. I think you know it's not just that a certain kind of language is being regulated, or but there's also that that speech implies a subject and a certain kind of subject uh, whose uh, utterances are legible, are understandable. And I'm not meaning this in any abstract way, but imagine imagine the freedom of speech being claimed by somebody. Uh, who's in, in trance or in possession, right? I mean, that becomes a completely incompatible subject, a subject that's not understandable in, under the rubric of freedom of speech, right? So what kind of subject do we have to also reform in order to get out of the traps, maybe? Yeah. 
And I would just probably say that as a criminal defense attorney, I'm not interested in justice because the people I rep justice is not necessarily a good in that sense. Um, which is why I think I'm more interested in advocating for the position that is not a solution and has no next, but to actually re remain in the kind of unbearable suspended state of actually being, being here for this, being here for the dissension and the disagreement and the lack of community harmony and consensus, including about what the rules are and what the law is. So I see my position as being more against the idea of any kind of authority, including the authority of good intentions or well-meaningness. Um, so at the beginning, um, Svetlana, you were talking about how the freedom of speech was more built off this momentum of civil rights and this kind of collective bringing into the public um, groups who have historically been you know, oppressed, marginalized, silenced. Um, and I guess of late, one case that I have found interesting that is kind of challenging the idea of freedom of speech as a collective kind of goal um, was the Janus decision. It's about the right of unions and um, the individual's right of, um, to not speak, similar to kind of what you're talking about, but the desire to not be political, the desire to not participate in labor organizing and kind of a, a neutrality um, tied to like the freedom of speech. And I guess to me, you know, where do we go with that complete neutrality of the hope to not say anything, you know, the desire to not move forward or back, but just to be stagnant in a way and individualistic. Um, I guess I find that kind of to me, it was, it's a, it was a disturbing decision because it you know, undermines a lot of um, public employees and how their ability to organize. Um, but so I guess the goal of freedom of speech of just to be silent and do nothing um, is something that's interesting with that question of like, why, why do we push for the freedom of speech is just to be an individual without a comment or a perspective. I mean, there is a perspective there the perspective of being neutral or absent of a desire to organize or collectively move forward. But I guess that's kind of something I've been curious about. I, mean, I think the specific decision you're referring to um, had to do with union dues mm -hmm. and union dues being used for a political lobbying. Right. So the, uh, the decision, at which I disagree profoundly with, was that um, you know, if you're paying union dues and if the union is lobbying, then you're sort of, you're being forced to speak in a mm -hmm. particular way. Whereas, I think the defense was that the unions, uh, they're also lobbying for your salary and so on. They're, they're serving a purpose for you. Uh, so being part of the union, and they, they kind of explicitly said that, that those dues are not going to be used for political lobbying. They're used for, you know, negotiating contracts. Uh, so I, I, I find the, you know, the decision just was a blow to unions. Uh, but on the other hand, that particular part of it where, you know, you're not, uh, you shouldn't be compelled to speak politically in a particular way. Well, clearly that, that is, you know, part of the right to freedom of speech is the right to not be compelled to speak in a particular way, not to have to say something that you don't want to say. So that's, you know, that it, it, the right to kind of speak differently or be silent, it is part of, uh, you know, the First Amendment uh, right to freedom of speech. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you very much for this really kind of fascinating conversation. I, in, in hearing the way people are talking. One of the words that I haven't heard much is expression. Um, the organization I work for, Article 19, we view ourselves as a freedom of expression organization. Speech is a form of expression. Silence is a form of expression. And I think it's interesting that in the context, that it's interesting to kind of compare 
the kind of U.S. First Amendment context here to kind of the international legal um, norm context. So the First Amendment speaks about Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Whereas the international article, um, the International Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, of which the U.S. is a signatory, says everything has, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So you can see how just in the space of time between when the Universal Declaration was signed after World War II and the, the beginning of the US government that the idea that it's not just about speech, it's about expression, it's about opinion, and also closely connecting the idea of information as being inherent and essential to the rights of expression. Um, and that's one of the things that actually there is no clearly defined constitutional right in the United States to rights to information. It's kind of, you have to interpret it, you have to look at the constitutional law, you have to build it up, but there is no rights to information, right to access information, unlike 59 other countries in the world where it is an explicit constitutional right that's in those things. And I think that's useful in this context of the discussion because from our perspective, looking at around the world and the battles of freedom of expression, what we see is the defining fight is the fight over narrative. It's who controls the narrative. And there are, you see this playing out in different ways. You see it in the sense of the Saudi feminist activist who's driven off of Twitter by strategic use of government trolling and bots by the Saudi government. So she's silenced because the government seeks to control the narrative of anyone who tries to counter the official government narrative by deploying government assets. You see it in the, the case of you know, research that's been coming out of a university in Geneva that points to the killing of a journalist, particularly with impunity, is often one of the precursors to continued authoritarian crackdown in a certain country, in countries. Like this, one of the things that they have found is that the killing of a journalist usually leads to further authoritarian measures. It's one of the best predictives of increasing authoritarianism. And I think this also links to the issue that was raised about data control, because in the new era that we're in, in online, if you talk to people in Silicon Valley, they talk about the attention economy. And there's a complete divorce between the idea of an idea, an idea having currency, and attention. Because the currency they go for is attention. And attention is driven by the marketing imperative and is driven by the data control imperative. And that's one of the really challenging aspects that we see because as been noted by all of you, these platforms are private. They're corporate private entities in which the profit imperative is driving the decisions that make over how we're realizing expression. And I think that is going to be, again, if we look at the control of the narrative, that's going to be one of the defining ways that the narrative will be controlled directly and completely by accident in terms of the way that the algorithms are directing us to different sources of information in the future. And so I do think it's one of the challenges that I think we need to be aware of in this community that it is going to be a defining battle. We really need to have good solutions to that, and I don't think that we're quite there yet. Right, and I think that goes with the sort of shift in um, talking about speech, that we, we used to live in, a, in an environment of scarce speech. You had limited news media, you had limited sources, so there were you know, tighter gatekeepers, uh, but it was an environment of scarce speech, so you had to get your message out in those uh, through a publisher, through news media. Now uh, there's a, this drowning out of speech. There's too much speech, and uh, I think the violence we're talking about applies to this. You know, who controls the narrative, and who is there to control your narrative, and how do you get your narrative out in a way that um, you know. Uh, because we, we also have data that uh, fake news are much more clickable than real news, of course, because they're, they're targeted at appealing to your desire for sensationalism, and they're also targeted to appeal to what you want to believe. So they, they circulate much better, and um, you know, in the way, I mean, uh, I, I come from Eastern Europe, so propaganda, you know, the, the making of kitchen appliances was not very good in Eastern Europe, 
Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the creation of propaganda was ex an extremely well-developed science. Uh, and now Putin is profiting from that and kind of exporting that. Like, uh, v and that, that is about the narrative. That is, you repeat a false narrative. You repeat it, and you insist on it, and people believe it. And we're seeing that <laughs> here now on you know, the, the government level. So that, that is um, a challenge. It's probably not going to be resolved by more censorship, but that is, I think, the, the current challenge. Just a small thought, which is that if if we are, I mean, I agree completely with what you're saying, uh, but if we are in a realm where we are talking about uh, uh, the manipulation of the mind at this level, uh, then in that state, what is free and what is what is consent, what is agreement, what is not, who's right, who's wrong. Uh, and so on. So if one has to address that, uh, would we be, I, I'm, I'm not disregarding any gains or saying one doesn't fight or and so on and so forth, but I'm speaking only in the context of the title, which is mapping the territory. So I'm just mapping, I'm not arguing, uh, not in that sense. But uh, I'm saying if, if that is the context that we are talking about, then would we be able to legislatively address this state of mind and fix it so that it can be fair and be uh, right and be uh, not manipulated and be just and have the right value and so on and so forth? Just very briefly, I mean, th there are legislative proposals, and they don't go into, I mean, to me, like, okay, so the way I define free speech, for which I fight every day, is the lesser evil. It's not, <laughs> I don't think free speech is like that, you know, free speech could be pretty bad speech. But censorship is, the, is worse. Um, but in terms of um, fake news and bots and so on, there are legislative proposals that are not directly targeting speech. They're about disclosure. So if you have like a bot having an, an ad on Facebook, at least you know it's a bot. And maybe if it's a political ad, you know where it's coming from. So th there, there are ways to, and there are legislative proposals, and I think they're probably going to pass. Uh, there are ways to address those issues without blunt censorship, because that, you know, that, that for one would not work. So. I'm thinking about, um a couple of things that have really attracted me in this conversation. I'm going to try to tie them together. One is um, the notion of the crisis of speech. Okay, that's one note. The other is um, this the the role that something that's not legislative might play in shaping um, the um, articulation of values of a community. Right. So. Um, that um, Svetlana and Mark both brought up these in different ways, in different moments. And I realize that I'm, I'm really um, thinking back to an old conversation about safe spaces that, um, that I would have with a group of people in college where we say there's no safe space, so let's, let's think about other things. And when I've had that conversation recently, um, it's a what, what I say in groups of people with whom I'm aligned politically is that rather than um, requiring a safe space and, and everybody agreeing to the same um, way of talking, I want to think about and articulate what it means for me to be a safe person to the other people in the space. Because then it's not that there are these um, rules that we have to all agree to, but that I want to think about what um, it, what it requires for me to be someone that you can trust, you know, and, and that, I, that I want to be that person, you know, so, um, and that I'm not going to actually expect anything from you all. I'm going to tell you what I can give you. Um, and f all this boils down to, to me, that, um, that the terms of um, speech among people who agree to be aligned politically will have to be, in order for it to work, will have to be um, 
made through dialogue. Uh, you know, and that that must always happen. I mean, it has to just keep going. It can't be settled. Um, um, and there are, you know, maybe it'll fail, right? Um, that that's a possibility. And I, I, I was think been thinking about this because I was thinking about the conversation of um, um, what happens when um, when somebody says something racist and it gets filmed, and then and something else happens and I thought I love that I love when people come together and say we don't like this and we you know and this is who this person is and we're gonna let you know that we don't like it I mean there's something about that to me that works um, and and I didn't say that before and I thought I should say it hey everybody um so great conversation today. I, I, I think just to kind of piggyback on what Mindy is saying about this sort of social uh, um, social media sort of um, um, admonishment that happens when people lose their jobs, you know, um, one of the things that happened, it seems to me, is that, that culture never caught up with the internet. You know, there was a, a moment at least, you know, and I guess everybody will uh, will say from uh, who's of a certain age will remember, well, oh, you didn't say those things in public or whatnot. And and the age of the Internet sort of like sort of opened the floodgates to ch just about anything. You know, you Google search, you are like a click away from anything you want to see. But the social, the, the, the mores and values, and, and I'm not saying value in a like, you should have good values. I'm not saying that kind of, because that's a judgmental kind of space, and I don't want to put that out there. But just, just sort of the sense of guardrails and how we deal with one another um, didn't seem to catch up to that. It didn't seem, it's like, so, so much is allowed now, speech-wise, if you listen to popular music or whatnot. Um, um, because I'm old enough to remember where some stuff you would hear today would be stuff that only the grown-ups would listen to after the kids went to bed. Um, <laughs> but that's now, that's kind of like typical pop music, you know? Um, and so th seeing people sort of, as Mindy's saying, sort of rise up and say, you know, that that's not okay, is actually reaffirming for me because it sort of shows that there is still some group sense of some guardrails that shouldn't be crossed. And I think those are those are some things that need to be reaffirmed. You know, as we talk about um, free speech, I do think that there are the social and societal um, rules that need to be reinforced. I don't think you can legislate a lot of this, you know, because as a lot of speakers have pointed out, it's really about you know the the First Amendment is about uh, a limitation on government, and I think we've so often just kind of don't get that piece of it right, and that's kind of a critical piece of what the First Amendment is. But, you know, just having some sense of, you know, how are we in relation to other people, and is that how we would like to be in relation to other people? Now, if your answer is no, then I guess all bets are off, but if your answer is, yeah, I'd like to be a better version of myself, then, you know, then maybe that forces some, some guardrails around. Um, the other thing I wanted to just say is that, like, it's really interesting to listen to this conversation um, and just think about the moment that we are in right now, which is, in some ways, feels so urgent, and and that urgency seems to um, compel action, um, and it seems to compel speech, and so it's hard to figure out, well, how do you you know, uh, if you see value in the kind of uh, the approach that um, Amar shows in his film, because there's a lot of value in just sort of, you know, just let me figure out what's going on with me um, before I begin to engage with other people. You know, there's that value. Um, I also think that for, particularly as we look in sort of like the lens of the United States, you know, African Americans, you know, um, can you claim, I wrote this, can you claim silence um, in a country you built which, but which quite often wants to render you invisible? You know, is that, is that like a, a, is that productive? And also, at the same time, we navigate this thing where it's like speaking up 
it's speaking up is uh, not necessarily seen as noble, but it's uh, disrespectful to those in power, which puts your life in danger. So there's a lot to kind of unpack here as we try to navigate what is the territory, the, what is the territory for whom, you know. Um, just throw that out there. And I think all of those points remind me of also the, are you plugging the holes in the wrong boat? Because there is this way where what I see is, or what becomes more, profound in a sense, even if I can say that, is that individual moment of that sort of jouissance that happens or that pleasure of calling out, shutting down, that the piling on pleasure, the part where the same video is posted over and over and over again, and if you don't post it, what's the matter with you? And if you didn't sign the petition, why didn't you? And that, and then maybe it's you, maybe it's you, you're the problem, you didn't do that. And so what I start to see too is the suspicion that I would have in myself of what's it in me that this is a permissible way to exercise my proclivity to violence. This is my this is my possibility. This is a socially acceptable within my chosen community way to say, for lack of a better way to say it, fuck that bitch. And so that's what what I start to wonder is, well, what's in it for me? What's what's the desire that's being activated here? And I've just found this outlet to activate it. And I may or I may believe with all my heart and soul in the ultimate good of, of its activation, but I may be enjoying in a not particularly pleasant way or desirable way the mode of that engagement and the manner in which I'm engaging. Can you say more about the I, I don't understand the distinctions you made just at the end between mm -hmm. what you may desire and may not desire. I mean that for me, one of the, because I come from two worlds. I come from the legal world and the art world. Mm -hmm. The legal world is highly functional. So every, all language has a point and a purpose. So if I say something in the legal world, it's to get a certain effect. Mm -hmm. In the art world, the capacity that the art world or the promise that it holds to me, that it, it actually throws something into a kind of state of suspended animation. So I can go through a lot of different registers of desire, feeling, affect. I don't have to make it functional necessarily. In fact, I would prefer not to. Because if I make it functional, then I'm, I'm in some ways curating the content towards a particular interpretation. So. I'm drawn to work that has that kind of more ambivalence, and I would distinguish that world, and maybe it's not a good distinction, but or it's interesting to think of social media as an aesthetic, as the potential for being an aesthetic platform versus a functional platform. Mm -hmm. If it's an aesthetic platform, then that's great. So all of that part where people are saying, well, I want justice, and this is why I'm doing that. That's true. What's also could be true is I want vengeance. And I do want to beat this person up. I do want to, and it, it may or may not have anything with, to do with that particular person. It may have to do with another kind of anger. It may have to do with, or my secret desire to beat somebody up. And I'm gonna pick this person. So if it's an aesthetic platform, then all of those things are fine because we can move through all of those things. If it's a functional platform, then there's a call to another response. You know, it's just like if you look at what Donald Trump says as an artwork, then it's, it doesn't have that same real world consequence necessarily of there's gonna be a dead reporter at some point, or there's gonna be a bunch, you know, another mass shooting, mm -hmm. but if we can make these distinctions between, oftentimes when I hear the word community, what I think people are talking about is a kind of curated community of people like themselves, as opposed to maybe a more spatial temporal analog kind of community, like right now we're a community. 
because we're just all here in this room, mm -hmm. which says nothing about shared beliefs or anything else. We're just coexisting in this time and space. So, and this goes back to the point that the gentleman made over there of how I act and what you said earlier, how I act here is possibly indicative of how I would like to be in a community. Mm -hmm. And if, if we had a kind of analog sensibility of the ephemerality of community and the non-guarantee of a public space as being a, shared, a space of shared ideas and beliefs, then perhaps that, that exorcism or that exercise of these other kinds of desires that these other kinds of um, engagements would seem less, less, need, less in need of legislating. Yeah, I guess um, Christopher uh, here from Union Docs, and I guess I'd like to pick up a little bit on this question of creating spaces, um, also that came up earlier from Laura's comment. Um, uh, and you know, in thinking about how uh, these questions of are impacting Union Docs work and the sort of space of documentary art out, um, that is there, uh, I have to say, like, in some ways, not very much because, um, you know, uh, the moments in which documentary recently have sort of prompted some kind of uh, response of, of censorship or some question around um, uh, around uh, freedom of speech has, have been fairly rare. I can think of a few instances in the last few years. Conversely, I was just at a, a festival in Lisbon where um, there were uh, a major conflict with the embassy uh, uh, in Turkey over the use of the word genocide, where there was uh, major protests from U U um, Ukrainian activists around the screenings of films. And I'm like, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> that we can't sort of incite this. And it's not for lack of trying, because you know, we, two, two nights ago we showed a, f uh, th three nights ago we showed a film uh, that was suppressed for many, many years. And I think one of the most, uh, insurgent sort of pieces of cinema I've seen recently came from some alumni of our program and some fellows there. Um, so it's, it's kind of not for lack of trying, but I think it, uh, what, what, what is offered to us maybe in this space of, uh, or in this, uh, in, in the idea of creating space through culture and through documentary um, is something uh, a little different. And I think it speaks to some of your comments just there. Um, for us, we already had this interested in programming work uh, towards the discussion and towards the commentary that the people in the room would have. And I actually think within the um, cultural art space, there's, there's sometimes a lot of disdain for the audience actually speaking back. Um, and we have instead many experts in the room to speak towards these conversations versus um, uh, maybe people who are uh, less involved in these discourses but perhaps have different uh, uh, territories that they might take us into and um, I think that yeah that kind of uh, you know concern about the cringeworthiness of conflict within a in a cultural audience I think is is a form of sort of um, uh, control of speech that happens pretty regularly um, and I don't think it's something that's happening in this room necessarily uh, and I, and certainly the institutions that are involved in this kind of this program are not like that but um, but having kind of a small space where conversations can have be happen actively where they can be unpredictable where they can where there can be tough questions asked um, you know are we have a space in Williamsburg and you might uh, think that we are it would be would would sort of attract an echo chamber uh, of consensus but surprisingly that's not the case um, there's often uh, there's often conflict and uh, though those conflicts rarely sort of move to this, the level of uh, you know, freedom of speech issue or creating a lack of safety for the participants in the conversation. I do, um, there have been some conversation, many conversations that are sort of thinking about, uh, that create a kind of conflict that might make cultural programmers really uh, frightened. Um, and, and one of my favorite uh, sort of moments from a, a 
a Union Docs kind of conflict like this was in which uh, I remember very carefully or, uh, an activist saying fiercely that you know a bullet exiting the barrel of a gun um, should not be concerned with the beautiful parabolic arc it made and this kind of question around formal choice in documentary and it's and the urgency of the issues that sort of documentary is hoping to speak about is something that comes up often as a point of these kind of conflicts and actually that can be a fierce conversation um, last night I don't think we got to we were thinking about militant cinema <laughs> by any means um, but I did want to kind of just return to this question of darkness and think about the film um, and narrative because in so many ways this uh, there was a lot of conversation, and just to bring present a little bit of the conversation that was there at Union Docs last night, there was a lot of question about what, what the sort of narrative of the piece was and what the sort of function of the protagonists, the setting, the scene, the um, secondary characters, what their meaning and value was in terms of the, um, uh, the, the piece of work. Uh, and to me, it was extremely interesting and maybe an, an equally interesting question to ask was um, to notice how lightweight that narrative actually was um, and the way in which it provided a structure that an artistic practice could hang within and a practice that Amar spoke to about um, thinking of waiting uh, as a methodology and, uh, and within waiting, finding a kind of topology of, of darkness, finding a way to see darkness anew, and seeing new, new things in that work. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's not just about like creating a, a series of sublime images that t take us somewhere. It really was something more of a, of a struggle through that. And I guess, and it offers us not something like that we can necessarily, I think, know or understand, but um, or, or really have too, too many things to say about, maybe specifically, but it does somehow offer us something that I think, in terms of practice and methodology, one might emulate and one might think about um, uh, bringing into their way of seeing the world. Um, and, uh, and in that, I think it's, 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 it's an exercise that, um, that has to happen collectively and has to happen with, with other people in the room and that also, uh, you know, the ways in which the interpretation of, narr it kind of evades the interpretation of narrative. So just a few thoughts to bring uh, uh, the, the film back. Okay. All right, so I guess when I think about freedom of speech, it's useful for me to separate the idea of both speech and freedom to understand it more. Because uh, speech, in my opinion, speech on its own is kind of empty, can mean anything. What is more important about it is the freedom aspect, whereas if you think about the struggles for freedom of speech, specifically in the context of the United States, it was always about a struggle to create room for a goal, right? A goal that wanted to be achieved. So you would struggle for freedom of speech to advocate for a change that you'd like to see or to struggle against something which you believe was wrong. The idea was still about the freedom aspect more. It wasn't about the speech of what somebody is saying. So I think when we think about freedom, there's a reason why the conversation turned to the idea of violence, because now we're thinking about when it's acceptable to use force and when it's not to defend the idea of freedom. And freedom on its own can also be sort of an empty term, but I think it's useful to think of freedom as the idea that anyone in a given society or space has the right to pursue their life to the fullest extent possible, and everyone should have that freedom and you should not interfere with other people's freedom to do so, so we can all struggle to be free together. Which is why things like, you know, racism, institutionalized authority, authoritarianism on its own, sexual abuse, rape, all those things, we should have contempt for them because they interfere with other people's abilities to live their own lives, to be comfortable who, who they are, to be free from harm and, um, sort of like from the initiation of force. So it's, it's, it's useful to think of the struggle as a struggle for freedom and how do we use speech to either achieve freedom or how is speech used to negate 
freedom in that aspect, in my opinion. And that's pretty much just what I want to add to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I realize that we really could, you know, in some ways should go on much longer, but there are more seminars, and I just want to urge you to please stay with us and return. Come to the Verily Center website and get updated on the next programs, the first one coming up in Decem on December 3rd. Before we close, though, it was really lovely to hear from some of our partner organizations, Weeksville and um, Union Docs and Article 19. We haven't heard from the New York Peace Institute yet, and Anna Kay, I think, offered to say a few words um, reflecting on the conversation. Uh, yes, sure. Hi. I'm Anna from New York Peace Institute. Um, and uh, well, I have to say first, when, when Karen had reached out to me, um, we were a little hesitant and we started to think, well, we know New York Peace Institute is connected to this. We help people have difficult conversations. We know in a very kind of interpersonal, individual level, uh, we're connected to this conversation. But it can uh, be a little difficult to take uh, our perspective out to a much higher level in a lot of the theoretical conversations that have um, happened here. So what I'll, I'll do instead is just talk a little bit about what New York Peace Institute does, how we help people have those conversations, and um, a little bit about uh, the seminar that we're uh, thinking of in June. Um, so just to say, you know, as we help people have difficult conversations, we, our work is in uh, conflict re resolution services, primarily mediation, and um, we serve Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, and we also provide training. So for many of our clients, we're an alternative to the court system and uh, also to police involvement. Our services are confidential, and there's no public record of them whatsoever. Um, and uh, similar to some of what Christopher said, conflict is often you know, something that's to be avoided, um, to be scared of, and kind of the unknown and connecting to a Mars film, you know, uh, a darkness. Um, for us, we really see conflict as possibility. And we really trust in, um, in our clients and their self-determination as individuals to uh, determine their own solutions to whatever their conflict is. Um, and so a bit about the process. Uh, by design and by profession, um, as mediators, we remain neutral. And we help facilitate a conversation. The conversation normally starts out quite angry and a lot of emotion, um, very often offensive language, um, covertly or overtly. Um, and we don't shy away from that kind of the ugliness or the bitterness. Um, one of our mottos is that we go towards the heat. And so we kind of believe that some of, some of that uh, difficulty, the bitterness or ugliness or however it's communicated, has to get out initially. And then we provide a process where uh, both parties can feel heard and not always, but hopefully come together and determine their own solutions. Um, so with a little bit of that context, uh, what we're thinking of for June is to look at these kind of everyday manifestations or real world manifestations, some of which have been, you know, touched on tonight of, uh, you know, where the inherent conflict of freedom of speech and, and how that manifests in, in an interpersonal level, uh, you know, as a journalism, journalist or as, you know, the person who has to monitor and facilitate a comment section on, you know, New York Times or, or who knows, and, you know, and social media as well. Um, so we're, on the individual level, it's like a microcosm of so many of these conversations that are happening. Um, and we are looking forward to being part of this, this series and um, in June, our session. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Maybe Svetlana. Yeah. I, I, just, I, I just have to, I just got an email, and I just have to read it. Um, and it's uh, apparently a new journal of controversial ideas launching next year. And uh, an international group of university researchers is planning a new journal which will allow articles on sensitive debates to be written under pseudonyms. They feel free intellectual discussion on tough issues is being hampered by a culture of fear and self-censorship. <laughs> Maybe a perfect place to end. It's not solely. <clears throat> The issue of speech is not solely political. Um, uh, uh, there, there's, uh, uh, if anybody has ever worked in a corporate culture, you know, you, you need to adapt to that corporate culture, or you're not very promotable. Anybody who's been to a faculty meeting knows the style of speaking that goes on there, and you need to adapt to that. Um, when the uh, neo-Nazis were marching in Charlottesville, they were chanting, "The Jews will not replace us." But because they were neo-Nazis, nobody felt that they had the credibility to say anything. And so nobody asked them what they meant by that. When the uh, Rust Belt was rusting, uh, the, the, the upper middle class educated people at the new school just completely ignored um, uh, all those people who were earning $30,000 a year jo an hour jobs and, 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 and lost them all um, uh, because they had nothing more than a high school education. They, people looked down their noses at them. I saw that you know, in, in the early 70s in, in Waterbury, Connecticut, when Anaconda Coppola went out of business, putting one quarter of the, uh, the workforce in the North, central Norcotic Valley out of work. And nobody cared. Um, uh, and, and so the, the important thing is to listen to people's grievances, even if they don't have the education and the eloquence and the articulation um, uh, to, to, to speak, uh, because then the only thing they have less is violence. And we're coming to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I think. Um, there's a lot of struggling we need to do together to make our way through these topics, which we will do over the coming months. Um, so please check back in on the Viralist website to, um, and, and please mark your calendars for December 3rd. It's gonna really be a spectacular one around feminist manifestos. It's a good one. Oh, and, um, thank you, I, I, I thought that was a great discussion where we didn't get anywhere, that's a good thing. We just, you know, I, I think it's very hard to do that sometimes. <laughs> because you kind of a debate, you get to a conclusion, and we're, we're really kind of, you know, dwelling in it. And, um, and thank you all for that. Thank you. Thank you.